morning, everybody. Hopefully you've had a great week. I'm so excited to close this series called Distracted with a very special guest speaker. If you were at the men's retreat last year, you heard him. Pastor Phil Lewis is with us today. Let me give you a little bit of backstory. I have known Phil Lewis a long time. I was actually a teenager in youth ministry when he was youth pastoring at another local church just down the way, um, right there in St. Pete, Florida. And uh, I got to know him there. He had, he had such a cool factor about him. I remember that as a teenager. I'm like, this guy is cool. Now that he's gotten older, not so much. But now, I mean, <laughs> he's just got such a great communication way about him. He and I have a very good common denominator you might know and love. His name is Dan Seaborn. Um, Dan and Phil are great friends, long, long time. Dan and I are great friends. Phil and I have been great friends. And I really wanted to introduce him to the life of the church to close this series called Distracted. I wanted you to hear a different voice. Phil today leads an organization in Tampa Bay, Florida called Winning at Home. You know that Dan Seaborn founded Winning at Home. Well, Phil is the chief cook bottle washer and runs that chapter, a Winning at Home in Tampa Bay. He has three counseling offices. He's got counselors underneath him. He directs that. He's a counselor, life coach. He, he really speaks into families um, day in and day out. He's been a pastor forever and a day, and he's just such a great guy. The last couple of years, he and I have really reconnected. He has poured a lot of encouragement and life into me more than he knows. I, I consider him a dear, dear friend, and I wanted you to hear his voice today to close this series. Pray, two things to pray for. Number one, right now, they're closing down in our Greensboro campus. Pastor Anthony is speaking for the very first time in his life. He's bringing the sermon. So Anthony's probably done. So now he's, he's through sweat that he was so nervous this morning. I loved it. Pastor Tim is speaking at our South Knoxville campus today. And I wanted everybody to hear a different voice to close the series. Next week, we start something that I believe is once again a game-changing thought in the life of our church. We've got brand new church gear that you, um, you'll be able to get next week. We're going to be throwing, um, giving away a lot of our old church gear. So be here in one of the services. Everybody loves when we do that. We're going to be feeding our Saturday night crowd because Saturday night church is at 6. So if you want to have free food, come next come next week at 5. You're like, Brent, the UT game is at noon. It'll be over by 12.15. So you got plenty of time to be. I'm just kidding. We've got a new quarterback, so we'll see. Um, 5 o'clock to 5.45 Saturday night if you want to come and be a part of that. That's great. Then we start a brand new series that I promise you, if you miss it, you're going to miss something good. Your time is valuable to me, and you really, we all really need it. It's going to be great. But nothing better than right here, right now. I have bragged on our church to Pastor Phil for about two years now. Y'all better not let me down today. Edge of your seat. Get, get, get ready to get somebody to write with. This is going to be good to close this series distracted. Please, Pathways, give it up for my good friend, Pastor Phil Lewis. Do that. Come on. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. All right. So he got a chance to talk about me for a little bit. So I want to talk about him for just a little bit as we get started. And I just want to say some things that you already know about Pastor Brent Freeman. He's real. Everybody say real. real. He's real. And that's one of the things that I love about him is not only does he talk to us and share with you and share with me the good things that God is doing in his life, but also the things that he wished God was doing gooder in his life, right? I mean, not only the victories, but also the challenges that he faces. And I know the last couple of years with the loss of his dad has been really, really hard on him. And there's been some really dark times in his life, some times where he hasn't been getting any sleep. He's been through it rough. And, and I love the fact that he's a real leader. Craig Rochelle says, people would rather follow a leader that's always real than a leader that's always right. And you have somebody who loves you and cares for you. And I guess that would be the second thing I would say. Brent loves his family. He loves the Lord. And he loves this church. And much, much more than just something that's printed on a t-shirt. It really is tattooed on his heart. He loves you. Not, not, not the buildings. I'm not talking about real estate. I'm talking about the relationships. The relationships that he has with you. The relationships that he helps you cultivate with each other. Uh, he has a genuine love. I love hearing the stories when I call him. I say, tell me what's going on. And we would just baptize. And just to hear the students that gave their hearts, hearts to the Lord the last week. Amazing stuff. I love to hear all that kind of stuff. And I just want you to know the conversations that we have are always, are always filled with great stories of how much he loves you. And last, I, I just want to say that I, 
I believe that Brent is somebody who really gives, and he gives and gives and gives and gives. And he's one of those leaders that will, um, that will burn out long before he fades out, all right? He gives a lot of energy, a lot of time. He puts a lot of effort into the series that he shares, a lot of time and energy into the missions and things that are involved here. And I don't know that I have ever seen a church so busy building God's kingdom as pathways and amazed at all the things and how far you guys are reaching. And I just want to applaud you and say it is an honor to be here today to, to share and really to kind of put my voice, I guess, as Brent said, on this, on this series called Distracted. And I just want to share a little bit some things that I've been thinking about, some things that I think God has put on my heart. And, and again, the thing that I love the most about what Brent gives you is not just some practical steps, two ways to be a better dad, five ways to take care of your finances, whatever it may be, but the most practical step of all, and that is to come into a, a relationship, not to be religious, big difference. Religion is man's search for God. A relationship is God's search for for man, to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ so that your life can be totally transformed. You not only enjoy heaven, but you enjoy heaven on earth. And uh, it, it's exciting to be here today. So let me just add my voice to this series called Distracted. And I, I, I didn't think I would have such a, a, a powerful illustration as I, as I do today to talk to you about. But this past week, uh, my brother got distracted. He was out in his woodshed and he had the table saw going. You guys already heard this story? <laughs> All right, so I had a table saw going, and he had, to make, he had to make one cut on one piece of wood. So he... <laughs> made the cut, turned the saw off, and as he was turning to go out, he put his hand down on the blade. Oh. Now, the blade was turned off, but it was still spinning. And you know those big... Those big table saws, it takes a long time to go down. Now, the good news is he only lost the tips of his fingers. I mean, literally just the tips of his fingers. And, and I, thought about, I thought about that in relation to the series called Distraction, Distracted. This idea that, that him being distracted and not really paying attention to something that he's done for over 60, 70 years ago. We grew up in a... In a in a, in a home where our dad was a pastor, but he was also a contractor. So we grew up around tools our whole lives, and none of us have ever had any serious injuries. But for whatever reason, he was distracted that day. And the distracted took, took part of his fingers off. But you know what can happen in the distractions that Satan has for you? And he has one for everyone. The devil always has a distraction for you. For some of you, you're not losing the tips of your fingers. For some of you, you're losing your family. For some of you, you're losing your finances. And, and maybe even for some of you, 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 might be, you might be losing your faith. Struggling in your relationship with Christ. There, there, there's some things that are going on. And because of distraction... You're losing traction in the race that God has called you to live. Hebrews 12 says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Things that hinder and the sin that entangles. Those are all distractions. And so I, I want to talk to you today about, about, not so much about distraction, because Brent has done a phenomenal job at talking about all the different distractions there are. And some of you, you, you get this idea of the digital age and how we can be distracted by cell phones and fake book. You know that's what it is. And then there's also insta-lie. Right? But some of you aren't distracted by the digital stuff. It doesn't mean you're not distracted. When, when I was growing up, and I love the fact that Brent mentioned 14 times that I was older than him, and that a long time ago I was cool, and now I'm not cool. But the, the, the point is, when I was a youth pastor, the, the, their cell phones weren't around. That doesn't mean there wasn't distraction. There was, this, this was the distraction. When we would talk with parents about talking with their kids, they said, when your kid comes home and starts talking to you and you're at the table and you're reading the paper, you know, put the paper down, right? Don't talk to them like this. Well, how's your day? You know, put it, put it down. It's a distraction. And it, and it didn't start with newspaper. It started way back in the Garden of Eden, right? With two naked people called Adam and Eve in a garden full, full of fruit trees, but they were distracted by one fruit tree. Right? So destruction has, has, has always been there. So I don't want to spend a lot of time just talking about it. I, I don't know what your specific distraction is. I know you have one. I have one. What I want to do today, since, again, Brent has covered all that, I, I want to talk about how to stay focused. 
I, I want to talk about what we need to do in order to, no matter what our distraction is, to be able to deal with a distraction and to be able to do the big things because we're not distracted by doing the little things. And that's what really happens. God has some big things for you to do. Everybody say big things. Big. Say it big. Big things. Big. God has some big things for you to do, but you can be distracted by doing the little things and totally miss it. My family wasn't able to travel with me, but I thought I would bring a picture of them. <laughs> this is them. And you're like, oh, that's so cute. They, they did one of those, those crazy pictures. No, this is, this is, this is us. I mean, that, that, that's the way we pose. That's the way we live right there. And we are. We are a crazy family. And I tell people, just because I'm on this platform, just because I have a couple answers doesn't mean I have all the answers. I'm still struggling too. I'm still trying to be a good husband. I'm still trying to be a good dad. I definitely want to be a good grandpa. I have two daughters, which is why I'm bald. <laughs> you thought I just wanted to look like Dan, didn't you? I have two son-in-laws. Thank the Lord for them. They came. They're like, you know, Mr. Lewis, we'd like to talk to you about. You sure you can have her. Just take her. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> two daughters, two son-in-laws, two grandkids, and one wife. And we've been blessed, and we're still working at it. We're still trying to figure it out. And we get distracted. And sometimes I can get distracted. I, I believe that I'm supposed to be the leader of our family. I, I believe that I'm supposed to, to, to do some things, to say some things, to keep some things in order so that they, they're able to live lives and get on the right path and stay on the right path. And so I have to be careful not only to, be, to, to make sure that I'm not distracted, but I'm not distracted because I, I have a responsibility to them. And I want you to understand that today. That's kind of the focus of where I'm going today. You've got to understand that you can't be distracted not just because it will hurt you, but it will hurt others. And that's the power of, 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 of this particular message today that I want you to get in your head early on. So here's the idea, distraction. What, what, what are we going to say? When I began thinking about it and Pastor Brenda called me and asked me if I'd come and kind of lend my voice to this and talk a little bit about it, I began to think, well, what, what, what can I say about it? What, where should I go? What, what should kind of be the theme? And as I've said already, I kind of already have that, but... Uh, one verse came to mind, and, and it came to mind, I think, because God put it there, but it came to mind through reading an article called The Most Viral Verse of Scripture. How many of you use the Bible app uh, version? Anybody use that? Yeah, a few of you. Okay. Well, that is the most popular Bible app around. It's downloaded by millions of people. been around now for several years, and every year they do a rewind at the end of the year. And they look at the most downloaded scripture, most shared, most bookmarked, most highlighted. And for the last eight years, this particular verse has been the most viral verse around. And when I first saw the article, I, I, I tried to take a couple guesses at it. Well, it's probably, it's probably John 3.16, right? Some of you probably say, it's probably John 3.16. No. Well, maybe it's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ. No. Nope. And, and maybe, maybe you have some guesses of that. I didn't guess this. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, 9. And I was kind of curious. I thought, well, that's a good verse, but I don't know if I put that at the top. Well, my son-in-law, Reed, is a researcher for Baycare Medical, and he's a pretty smart guy. So whenever I have a question about anything, I call Reed. And I go, Reed, thank you for marrying my daughter. Thank you for taking her out of her house. But I have a question for you. What do you think about this verse, Joshua 1? Why do you think this verse is the most viral verse around? And he said, well, that's easy. He said, because, because this verse is a, is a very encouraging verse. And, and, and it's a very encouraging verse because people will find themselves in a, lot, in a lot of these different chapters in life. Some of you today, you're going through a tough chapter in your marriage. You're sitting beside your spouse and you're thinking, man, I hope I get something today that's going to help us to get to a better place tomorrow. I hope we can forgive each other. I hope we can get past this. I hope that, I hope that this isn't the way our marriage is going to be for the rest of our marriage and you're going through a tough time and you need Joshua 1 9 that says don't be discouraged don't be afraid the Lord is with you wherever you go he will never forsake you you need that maybe some of you are going through the high octane years of child rearing or you just got laid off or you're fighting an illness or you're facing a tough decision or you're starting a new job or you're you're, you're going through a breakup Whatever the case may be, and it may not necessarily be one of those, but you know what I'm talking about. You're going through something and you need to be reminded that, that the Lord is with you, that he cares about you and he's going to take care of you. And really, I love this idea because really what he's telling Joshua is, you got this because I got you. You got this because I got you. 
So what I want us to do today is I want us to, I want us to maybe ask the question, well, what does that have to do with distracted? How, how does that fit into this series? Why, why is that verse important? And I would just say that that verse is important because it is connected to a couple other verses that I think show us a man who was able to live a life where he was able to diss distractions and he was able really to stay focused. And I want you to stand together with me if you would. Uh, take your Bibles if you want to. Joshua chapter 1 verse 1 starting through verse 9. And we're going to read this together. We're going to stand not just so you can stretch your legs and kind of yawn a little get ready and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to stand because this is God's word. Everybody say this is God's word. <laughs> and when God says something, it's important for us to listen. It's important for us to follow it. And it's important for us to give it the honor that it's due. And so whenever I can, I don't do this every time I preach, but whenever I can, I like to have people stand so that they're reminded this isn't just something I'm reading out of a book. This is something that we are reading out of the book. Okay. So Joshua one, here we go. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, who is Moses's aide, Moses, my servant is dead. Everybody say dead. dead. That's how you know you're done. Right? I love what Perry Noble says. He says, if, if, if you're not dead, God's not done. So as far as I can tell, everybody in this room is still alive. So that means that God still has a purpose, a plan, still has a reason for you to be around. And so you have to be careful about being distracted because you've got to stay focused in order to get it right, what he wants you to do. So remember that. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. And I'm going to give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, let me stop right there for just a second. I want you to take note of this statement right here. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. This is, this is the beginning, okay? This is the beginning of something that God is going to say to Joshua. And this is much, much more than a pep talk. This is a prep talk for what he wants him to be able to accomplish. And he starts it by saying, Joshua, whatever I'm going to ask you to do, whatever I'm going to call you to do, I just want you to know I'm going to be there with you. You got this because I got you. And he goes on. And he says this, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn to it from the right or the left that you may be successful wherever you go. And keep this book of the law always on your lips and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. And then here it is, the viral verse. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And in one verse, or one word in verse 10, so. And basically what that means is after God had told him all this stuff, the Bible says, so Joshua went to the people and they started this journey together. He did what God asked him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us today. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Sometimes that's all you need, right? I mean, you don't need a super long prayer. You need to be honest about who can help you, and you just need to ask them for help. All right, so here we go. So this is about staying focused, and this is about dissing distraction, and it's about looking at a model for us. Oh. To help us to stay focused. Now, I live in Florida, and I'm a hunter. And this is what I hunt. All right, I hunt these delicious fish. Now, you can take this fish and you fillet it and you put it in a smoker all day long and at the end of the day, you come back and you take it and you flake it into a bowl and you add mayonnaise, sour cream, chopped onion, red, green, yellow peppers, little liquid smoke, and you stir it all together and you put it in the refrigerator. It is a beautiful thing. <laughs> and I love it. I love it. Now, I want you to know something. I... I I was a different kind of hunter when I was younger. All right? I wasn't really a big into fishing, partly because I lived in Indiana and little dinky lakes and bluegills, and those are a lot of fun. But I really got turned on to deep sea fishing when I moved to Florida. But before that, when I was in college, I used to hunt with a buddy of mine. His name was David. And I remember one day, David and I had gone out hunting, and we hunted in this field with this farmer who, who, who allowed us to go there, and, 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 it, and it had a, a, a giant giant, giant field. And the field was full of little divots and little ditches and all kinds of stuff like that. And what had happened is in the wintertime when it would rain or when it would snow and, and the grass would kind of lean over, it, it, would, it would glaze over with just a thin layer of ice and snow. And so when you're walking through the field hunting for big game like rabbits, 
<laughs> we, uh, we, we would be walking along and all of a sudden you'd hear this crack and you would fall down in this ditch. And it was, it was kind of disturbing considering you're holding a gun. Okay, so you had to be a little careful. So we, we, we got used to it. We kind of, you know, were prepared and, 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 and kind of cognizant of what was going on. And so, so one day we were out hunting and, and, and David's about, he's about probably 50 feet to my right. And we're walking along, we're looking for rabbit. And all of a sudden I hear this crackle and I, and I hear kind of this thud and I look over and he's down in the ditch about up, up, up to his waist. But that's not really what I noticed. What I noticed was there was this big, furry, juicy rabbit right behind him. And so I did what I thought any hunter would do. I said, duck! And as he went down, my gun came up and I shot right over top of his head. And I, I, got, I got the rabbit, just in case you wondered. But I lost my friend that day. Not because I shot him, but because when he came out of the hole, he said, I'm never hunting with you again. You are a crazy man. And I said, whoa, 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 yeah, you, you, you ducked, I, I shot. No, I'm not ever going to. You're focused on the wrong thing. And so I want to make sure that today, not only do we kind of n- not spend a lot of time talking about distractions, because it's going to be different for all of you, and it's going to change in a couple years. It may not be cell phones. It may not be fake book. It will be something else. It will come along and distract you. So we're not going to spend any more time on that. We want to stay focused. But here's the deal. We got to stay focused on the right things. Not just good things, but godly things. See, I think for Christians, a lot of times we get things messed up because we, we're focused on good things. The struggle for us is to really, really, really stay focused on the godly things and to make sure that we're living our lives not just good, but for the Lord. And so what I want us to do today, again, taking, taking this story of Joshua as our model because the Bible says that he made it. He, he got it right. He figured it out. He was able to stay focused. And he was called... On the day that he died, he was called a servant of the Lord because he had been faithful to what God had called him to do. How about you? Are you going to be called faithful? Are you going to be called a servant? Is the Lord going to be able to say, well done, because you weren't distracted, but you stayed focused as a husband, you stayed focused as a wife, you stayed focused as a mom, you stayed focused as a dad, you stayed focused as a student? You got it right. The reason we're looking at Joshua is because this is true in all of our lives. Whenever somebody models something for us, it makes it much, much easier for us to do that. And so we want to look at his life because it's easier to do something when somebody else shows us how it's done. So I want to jump right in and begin looking at this. And if you have your note, guys, I want you to write down some things. Again, some of it might might be some things that I say. Some of it might be some things that the Lord just kind of speaks to your heart. Whatever it is, jot it down. Jot it down. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people. I love this, this kind of this power couple, these words. This isn't about muscles. This is about mindset. Strength and courage, when he's talking about, has nothing to do with a, a physical build. This has to do with a spiritual build. This has to do with this, this, this aggressive attention to following God and the willingness to be strong about it and to be courageous about it. And he's going to say this three times. And at first you think, well, God, you're just repeating yourself. Yeah, he's repeating himself, but he's defining something a step of the way every time he says it. And so we're going to look at those things. The truth is we need to be strong and courageous. And, and the best way to do that is when we, when, when we become partners, when we become companions with something bigger than ourselves. That's where, that's where courage comes from. When I was growing up, I wasn't six foot two until I was a senior in high school. In fact, I was a little bird of a boy for a long, long time. And when I, uh, when I, when I entered middle school, I loved to play football, but I always got hurt playing football. Something was always broken after the game, and it was usually me. And so I, 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 I wanted to, to play football, but I didn't want to get hurt. And I, and, I, and I found this guy, his name was Dana Key. Now, Dana Key was one of the biggest guys in our neighborhood. And he told me, he said, Here, here's going to be our plan. The ball's going to be thrown to you. People are going to run to you, and they're going to want to kill you. So, so tell me again the, the plan. He said, so when they start running to you, what I want you to do is I want you to reach back and I want you to grab hold of my belt. And then I'm going to run as fast as I can. All you have to do is hang on. <laughs> okay. All right, I can do that. So sure enough, the ball was thrown to me. People were coming to me wanting to kill me. Dana was standing there, grabbed my belt. I grabbed the belt. He takes off. I'm flying behind him, just kind of fluttering in the wind behind him. I can hear grunts and groans and I see bodies flying out of the way. And I get to the touchdown because I was... Connected to someone much, much bigger than me. And I want to tell you something. You're, you need to be connected to someone bigger than yourself. And I mean that with the Lord. 
That's why Joshua was able to do this. Be strong and courageous for I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And Joshua held on to that. And because of that, he was strong and courageous. And out of a handful of people out of the Bible that, that, that finished well, Joshua is at the top of the pack. And so we want to look at his life and see what it has to say to us. So let's take a look. First thing that God says to him, you're going to lead these people. Everybody say lead. lead. You're going to lead these people. So write that in your notes, lead these people. And this isn't just something, again, we're not just looking at Joshua's life and thinking, oh, that was a cool life. I, he had some good things. No, no, no. We're going to do a kind of a, a copy and paste of what he did, and we're going to apply that to our lives. We're going to look at the same modeling and patterning that he did, look at this template, and we're going to say, okay, what Joshua did worked. And so we're going to do that. And I just want to tell you something. This, this, this whole thing is not, a, is not an automagical thing. This, this doesn't just happen. You don't, you don't give your heart to the Lord and then everything just fall into place. Our, our pastor a couple weeks ago at our church, he said, he said, what works takes work. Okay? You, you want to have a dream home? You can't just dream about it. A dream only works if you do. No matter what the great theologian Stephen Tyler says, dream on, dream on, dream on, dream until you're, you rockers, <laughs> right? That's not the way it works. You can dream all you want and nothing's going to happen. And I, I shared this with the, the, the men at the retreat. You can have these uphill hopes, but still have downhill habits and you'll never get to where you want to go. And so this isn't something that happens automatically. This is something that takes work. And so I just want you to be aware of that. Lead these people, all right? You can be a great leader without being just like other great leaders. And I love the staff here. They're diverse. They're different. Pastor Brent is Pastor Brent. Pastor Matt is Pastor Matt. Pastor Keith is Pastor Keith. They, 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 they're all different. They're not expected to be a second Brent. They're expected to be a first Matt. They're not expected to be a second Brent. They're expected to be a first Tim. They're not expected to be a second Brent. They're supposed to be a, a first Anthony. And, 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 the, and, and the point is, God is not looking for Joshua to be a second Moses. He's looking for him to be a first Joshua. So whoever you are today, there are people that can be your role models, but God wants you just the way you are. Turn to the person beside you and say, you're okay. That's a long time to say that. That was just, okay. So look at this. Look at the difference. Moses was a shepherd. Joshua was a soldier. Moses considered their complaints, listened to them. Joshua confronted laziness and fear. Moses provided water from a rock. Joshua said, you thirsty? Get you a shovel and dig your own well. Okay? So very, very different leadership. And here's, here's one other thing that I would say. Now, now, Joshua did replace Moses as a leader because they needed a different leader because it was a different time. And I just want to say something to you. You don't always have to replace the leader if the leader can change. Husbands, it's not that your wife wants a different husband. It's that she wants her husband to be different. Husbands, It's not that you need a different wife. Maybe, maybe you need to pray that your wife will be different. God can change us. And that's, that's one of the things that I want us to understand as we move through this. As we lead people, God, God can change the things in us. We don't have to give up. We don't have to quit. Just allow him to make us different. Leadership is influence, John Maxwell says. Everybody say influence. Leadership is influence. We, a lot of times we think leadership is position. It means you're on a platform. It means you're a CEO. It means you're a manager. It means you're a pastor. No, that's a leadership position. And I just want you to know the Bible teaches us that even though you may not have a leadership position, you have a leadership disposition. And you have the opportunity to influence people. If only leaders could do it, then Pastor Brent is the only person that could ever lead somebody to Christ. And that's not the way it works. But you have influence, no matter who you are, no matter how extroverted or how introverted. I love this. Even the most introverted person in the world will influence over 10,000 people in their lifetime. That's why we got to get it right. We can't be distracted. We've got to stay focused. That's what we do at Winning a Home. We work with moms, dads, husbands, wives, single seniors, uh, uh, sons and daughters, and we work really, really hard at helping them to understand how God has created them and the purpose that he has for them and that they have a place in this world. Now, here's the interesting thing about what God said to Joshua. Joshua, you're going to lead, but you're going to lead these people. Now, remember that Joshua's already been with these people for 40 years. He's already heard them complain. He's already heard them whine. He's already heard them make super, super dumb statements, bad choices, everything else. And I, if I were Joshua, I'd say, hey, God, I'm totally fine with being a leader, but do I have to lead these people? 
Is there another group of people? Can I choose? I'd like to choose number two. Is there another one? And, and, and God would say, no, I want you to lead these people. And the truth is, for all of us, sometimes you don't get to choose who to lead because God has already chosen who he wants you to lead. I heard a couple guys talking and the guy asked his friend, he said, so you have four kids. His friend said, yeah, yeah, I do. So if you had it to do all over again, would you have four kids? And he goes, yeah, just not these four kids, okay? I, I would want different kids, okay? So, so the point is, is that, yeah, there would be times as we lead people that we would probably say, I wish I could lead them. I wish I could lead, I wish I could do. No, but God has put them in your life. God has put that neighbor that lives beside you in your life. God has put the person that you work with in your life because he wants you to lead these people. God has put your family in your life because he wants you to lead them. I love what Acts says. Paul is giving this sermon and he's talking about God and how, how God has planned and orchestrated everything. God began by making one person and from him came all the different people who live everywhere in the world. And God decided exactly when and where they should live. Now I have two brothers and a sister and my mom used to call me a surprise. She said, now, Philip, I'm not going to call you an accident because that doesn't sound very good. But you were a surprise. We weren't planning on you. And I said, well, you know what, Mom? God was. God was. And he put me right here and now. And for right now, and I hope forever, I get a chance to be a friend of Brent. I get a chance to be an encouragement to him. I get a chance to stand in front of some wonderful, wonderful people this week and talk to you about a wonderful, wonderful God. And guess what? It's, it's not a mistake. It's by design. And so the people that God puts in your life, some of them will drive you crazy. Some of them you don't want to be around. Some of them you wish you could get rid of. But God has you there because you can make a difference in their life. Lead these people. Second thing, second time we hear God say this, be strong and courageous. He adds an extra word. This word in the Hebrew is called ma'ad. Everybody say ma'ad. Ma'ad. That's pretty good. Try it again. Ma'ad. Ma'ad. All right. And this means very, 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 and just keep going forever. It means a really, really big thing. Very courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Now, why, why would he say be strong and courageous because you're going to lead these people? And then when he gets to this one, be strong and very courageous. So we need to pay attention and see what he's getting ready to say that we need to have more courage than we did before because this is a really, really big deal. Well, here's what it is. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law. Everybody say, all the law. And what that means is, that means all the law. That means God's word, what he teaches us. And maybe you're like me. Have you ever tried to make a deal with God? You're looking through and you go, you know, that's, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know it says that. Whew. I know I'm supposed to raise my kids. I know I'm supposed to love my wife. I know I'm supposed to talk nice about them. I know I'm not supposed to gossip. But I'm going to kind of try to make a deal with God. And I would just tell you, God's willing to make a deal. You just do what he says. That's his deal. Okay? So I don't want you to forget that. And one of the things that I talk to, when I, when I sit across the table and I have a big table like this in my office, a little bit bigger, a chair here and a chair there, and I usually sit here, and a husband and wife, they come in, and I do some marriage and, and family coaching and stuff like that. And I begin to talk to them, and I get to this place where I get a chance to share with them about God and what he can do in their lives, and here's the plan. A lot of times they'll say the same things that Christians say. Is there, is there something else, you know, besides the Bible, something besides memorizing, besides reading, besides staying focused on God's word? Is there something else we could do that would really make? No. No. No, stop looking for it. You're wasting a lot of time. This is it. Okay? So this is why he is saying to Joshua, this is going to be the hardest thing you will ever do in your life is to follow my word because it is tough. But this will be the most important thing you will ever do in your life. It will keep you away from distractions. Psalm 119 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can a student today in 2019 keep his way pure? You know what it says? By living according to God's word. That's it. That's it. Be strong and very courageous. And then he says, don't turn from the right or to the left. Again, he doesn't put in what distraction is. There were no cell phones back there. There were no newspapers back there. But I guarantee that Satan, devil, had a distraction for Joshua. 
And he said, don't turn from the right or to the left. Stay focused on this. So here's the point. Live this way. This is the way you got to live. This is the way you got to live. So he's going to give a bunch more instruction. I want us to just kind of take a second and look through what else is he saying about how important God's word is. He says, keep this book always on your lips. And I thought that meant that you just use scripture everywhere you went. Every time you talk to somebody, instead of just using English words that we're all familiar, we would just use words from the Bible and we would just kind of talk. No, that's not what it means. What, what this means is, this means, well, let me explain it like this. Our words are to be influenced by the word. Okay explain a little bit more. Now, I've been in, I've been in Tennessee now for a while. Uh, We had a home, uh, family home in North Carolina for 40 years. Uh, I've been in the South. My brother lives in Kentucky. I was uh, born in Indiana, uh, grew up in Louisville. Uh, So, I I have, I have a lot of South in me, okay? So, but, but I have heard some things I haven't heard for a while since I live in Florida. This is one of them. While I've been in, while I've been in Sevierville the last couple days, I've heard people, you know, talking, oh, I'm fixing to go to the store. I've heard this one too. Y'all come back. Anybody here use these phrases? All right, all of you. All right. And then here's my favorite one. I love sweet tea. All right. So, so what I'm saying is, is these phrases, these statements, these words come from a certain place. I don't hear them a lot in Florida unless that person is from the South. And so when you hear these things, you know where that person is coming from. Now check this out. Where you are coming from determines what is coming out of your mouth. Husbands, you want to get it right with your wives? You want to say the right things to your wife? Somebody better say amen. Amen. (laughs) You spend time in God's word and the right words will come out. Wives, you you want to get it right with your husbands? You spend time... (laughs) It always is that. I don't know why, but it always is that. You spend time with God's word because what, what's coming out of your mouth is representative of where you're coming from, all right? Not just geographically, but spiritually. Our pastor says, we're better with people when we've been with Jesus. So hopefully after church today, you're going to be at a better place in your relationships. Hopefully after you spend time in God's word, you're going to be at a better place in your conversations. Next thing it says, it says meditate on it. Meditate on. Now, when I was growing up, the word meditate to me was, I had this picture of somebody crossing their legs. I'm not going to do it. I can't do that. But crossing their legs with their fingers like this saying, (laughs) and you did too, obviously. But that's not what this word means. That's not what this word means. In the Bible, the word meditate is is a Hebrew word, hagah. Everybody say hagah. Hagah means this. It means mutter, speak, self-talk, repeating. This is, here, I'll give you a good example of, of meditate. Oh, it's so dumb. I cannot believe that I did that. It's so stupid. Why in the world was I ever born? That's meditation. We, we think those are just, you know, when we're going through some frustration, but I want you to know something. When you speak those things, your mind doesn't go, oh, he doesn't really mean that. Your mind takes that, hears that, thinks that, and believe it or not, that becomes wired into your behavior. You would never say that to someone you love or you shouldn't. You would never say that to your children. Why? Because you know it will affect them. So do you think it won't affect you? So God says, what I want you to do is you've had a lot of things spoken into your head, spoken into your mind, and because of that, it has wired you. And I want to rewire you. I want you to meditate on my word so that you're not distracted by stuff and so that you will stay focused on the right things. And so that's why it's important to take God's word and to say it over and over again. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ. Now listen, what's interesting about that is a lot of times people think, well, that, that sounds kind of new agey. That sounds kind of, uh, you know, positive thinking. Well, you can call it whatever you want, but it started in God's word. And he's the one that first taught us that we're supposed to say these things over and over again. Why? Because they will change the way we think about ourselves, the way we think about distractions, and the way we think about him, okay? John Orberg says, if you can worry... You can meditate because worry is the same thing where you've thought about it over and over again and you've said negative things over and over again until those negative things affect your personality, they affect your relationship, they affect your spirituality, they affect your finances, they affect everything. And if you can worry, you can meditate. James Allen says, a noble and godlike character is not a thing of favor or chance. In other words, it doesn't happen automatically that you get this thing in your head because you gave your heart to Christ, because you got saved. 
That doesn't automatically change your mind. That's why Romans 12 says, be transformed by the what? The renewing of your mind. How do you do that? Through God's word. It doesn't happen automatically, but it's a natural result of continued effort in right thinking, the effect of long-cherished association with God-like thoughts. Where do you find God-like thoughts? Right here, okay? And do it day and night. Do it consistent. Nothing that does not occur daily will ever, ever dominate your life. So live this way. And then finally, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. All right? Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. This is what shuts us down. This is what keeps us from doing and following through on all the things that God has put in our heart to do. So last until you pass is what I want you to write in your note guide. Get it done. Go all the way to the end. Finish well. Because here's the truth. There is something that God has for you alone to do. Okay? There's something that God has called me to do. And I think there are several purposes that I have. But I think that God has called me at this chapter in my life to be a marriage and family coach and champion and say, you can do it. You can make it. No matter how bad off your marriage is, no matter how messed up you are, you can, you can do it. But you have to do it. You can wish it. You can want it. But until you work at it, it's not going to happen. And people are always interested in changing their circumstances without changing themselves. It doesn't work that way. And God is giving us a, a, a blueprint, a template that we can look at and we can, we, can, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's already been proven. Joshua did it. And he got, he got the trophy. Well done, good and faithful servant. So last till you pass. So how does that, how does that play out for us? How, how can we take some next, next steps today? And I, I want to give those to you. I think there might be some of you here today who, who do need some help. You, you're distracted by some stuff. You're, you're headed in the wrong direction. And, and you're, doing, you're doing some little things, you're distracted by some little things, and you're missing out on some really, really big things. You might be a student here today. You might be in middle school. You might be in high school. You might be a young adult. You might be married. You might be, I, I, I don't know. But there's some stuff that's going on. And if you were to be honest, if I were to sit down with you and look across the table at you and say, hey, can I, can I just ask you a question? Are you, are you doing okay? Do you need help in any area of your life? You would say to me, I do. Because this is what I get from couples who sit here. They come in, they're a mess. Their marriage is struggling. They're, most of the time they call, and here's the statement. We have the divorce papers. We've decided it's over. Can you help us? And I tell them, why didn't you come in sooner? And they say, well, we thought about it. We talked about it. We wish we would have. And I tell them, when something happens in your life, when you're going through it, you've got to ask for help now. And I would say that to you. You've got to ask for help now. Because here's the truth. Procrastination is the enemy of success. Saying I'm going to change that tomorrow. Saying I'm going to be a better husband next week. Saying I'm going to do it differently as a wife. That you need to change that now. The second thing is, go big. When you decide to change something, don't mess around. Don't, don't, just, don't just try just a couple little things. When I, when I meet with couples and they're in that position, I, I say, you need, to do, you need to do something. You need to do anything and everything is what I call it. Anything and everything. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, you're right. We need to do anything and everything. And they come back the next week and they go, did you do anything and everything? Well, you know, we tried that for a little, but yeah, it's hard. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? And, and here's, here's the truth of the matter. You need to do something immediate, massive, imperfect, action. All right? Immediate. Right now, massive. As big as you can. Imperfect. You're going to get it wrong the first couple times, first 10 times, maybe first 100 times. But, 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 but do it. Okay? And then, and then finally, keep doing it until it gets done. I was coaching a young man. He was 22 years old. Super sharp guy. Had some things that were going on and I, I, I gave him a couple steps. I said, here's, here's what I want you to do. One, two, three, four, five. We get in with the conversation. He said, you know, Phil, that's, that's good. That's a really good sign. I know. I know. I know. He said, well, I, I've, already, I've already tried that. I said, really? He said, yeah, I, I worked with another coach, and he, he almost said the exact same thing. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, there, there's been a lot of success with this. Maybe that's why he said it. I, well, that's kind of strange. It, so this didn't work. He said, no. I said, well, let me ask you something. How, how, long, did you, how long did you try this? And he said, oh, well, I, and I worked at it. Boy, I, I worked hard. Well, tell, tell me how long you tried. I, you know what? I tried for a week. 
Isn't that funny? We, we think that something that has been wired into our brains over 22 years, we think we can change it in a week. No, it's going to change. It, it's going to take a lot longer. But I want you to know it can be changed. It's just going to take a lot of work. And it's going to take God. And so I want to I leave you today just by challenging you. I, I don't think the problem is that you don't know enough. I, I haven't really found that in, in, in conversations. What happens is we know what to do. We just, we just don't do what we know. And I, and I want to encourage as we wrap up this series, as we finish things up on this, this idea of being distracted, there will always be a distraction for you. The question for you is, will you stay focused? Will you trust God to provide you with the courage by being the companion of God with something bigger, something better? Will you take action? When you see things creeping into your life that begin to change your course, will you stop right then and there, call Pastor Brent, call Pastor Pat, get a hold of somebody in this church, reach out to a counselor, reach out to a mentor, and say, right now, today, I need help. I'd like to pray for you as we wrap things up today. Thank you so much for letting me be here and to share with you. And I just pray God's blessing on your church and on Pastor Brent and, and all the great things that God is doing here at Pathways. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you that you are a God that loves us and you are so full of compassion. And I pray that you would help us to represent you well. And the only way that we can do that is to get to know you well. And that, that description... That person is found in your word. But I pray specifically for moms and dads and husbands and wives and sons and daughters and singles and seniors who are here today. And they know, they know there's something distracting them. And this has been distracting them maybe for weeks, maybe for years. And they know that if it doesn't change, it will ruin them, it will ruin their family, it will ruin generations to come. The legacy that they leave will not be one that will encourage and help those following behind them. And I just pray, Lord, that you would encourage them today to reach out, to call out, to step out in faith, to make a change, and get some help. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, real quick, Phil. Pastor Phil. Give it up for Pastor Phil, everybody. Good stuff right there. Um, let's do this. He preached longer than I do, so that, that's good. Um, let's do this real quick. I want to pray with Pastor Fred. We haven't done this yet. He has started an organization, Winning Home Tampa Bay. He is so passionate to reach families and reach the home. When your home life stinks, everything stinks, and that is the battlefield today. So do me a favor. Grab the hand of the person on your left or right. Let's pray for Pastor Phil and what he's doing. God, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you for what he said, the words of truth. They're so good, such wisdom. May we put this into our lives. We pray for Pastor Phil and his wife and family, what they're doing in Tampa Bay, Florida. So many more people need to be doing what he is doing. He's taking that step of faith. He's reaching into a community. He's reaching into families. And there's so much hurt going on. So just be with him. Guide him, direct him. Keep him encouraged that he is making a difference. Keep us encouraged that we are making a difference. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. One more time. Give it up for Pastor Phil, everybody. Love you. Good stuff.